Well, hey, Marine Science, good morning or afternoon or evening. I'm not sure exactly where you are at when you're watching this, whether it's in the morning or in the evening. But it's the morning for me, so good morning. Um, food webs and action. We're going over chapter 16, at least part one in this video. Um, hope you're doing well. Hope you had an amazing Easter and your family as well. And that peace. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about food webs food chains and action, okay? So let me show you this picture here. This is off the West Coast, California. But if I were to ask you, what's all this green? Well, this is chlorophyll concentrations, chlorophyll. And chlorophyll, of course, is a pigment that allows photosynthesis to happen, but it's in the water. So as we know, there's no really plants and marine systems for our purposes, but there are phytoplankton and phytoplankton we're going to be talking a lot about in this lesson because phytoplankton is the foundation of marine ecosystems food food webs that is they monitor this from space it's a very important part of the ocean's food chain phytoplankton that is because many animals small fish and whales feed on them but also on what they you know krill krill eats phytoplankton so many whales eat krill Scientists can learn a lot about the ocean by observing where and when phytoplankton grow in large numbers. They use satellites, scientists do, to measure how much phytoplankton are growing in the ocean by observing the color of the light reflected in from the shallow depths of the water. So they can monitor this with satellites. It's pretty crazy. You can see the liar spots on this map is where phytoplankton is really abundant. And so our first little case example here is the North Atlantic right whale. Okay, North Atlantic right whales, they're filter feeders. They use baleen to filter feed, krill, various small things. And what's amazing is that, I don't know, I've never seen one. I'm sure you have to be kind of, you know, off the coast, and I've never been off the coast on the Atlantic at least. But you can see that they track, you know, animals, of course, and they are very abundant off the east coast of Florida. So you can see like how much, you know, where these organisms were. and They also go up into New, New England and such. But the different colors represent the chlorophyll concentrations. So red means really high chlorophyll concentrations. And so if I were to ask you what would that mean about phytoplankton, would they be really high or really low? Hopefully you would understand they would be really high because chlorophyll is inside phytoplankton. So you can see that phytoplankton being the foundation of this food web, and since the North Atlantic right whale are located where the phytoplankton are, then this suggests that they need to be around phytoplankton because they either eat them or perhaps something that feeds on the phytoplankton themselves. I'm going to ask you some questions, so I want you to figure that question out for yourself. But this is a picture of the North Atlantic right whale. You can see the baleen plates there that help them filter feed. They've been protected since 1970. The east coast of Florida and northward to Georgia is a critical habitat for the North Atlantic right whale. There's various rules and regulations for ships and fishing and nets and everything to try to protect these animals because they are very, very low in number. And so I want to ask you a few questions. You have four sets of questions I want you to answer in this video. and Email me the answers, please. But the first one's about the North Atlantic right whale. First off, why is it called the right whale? How many whales are remaining? What is their status? Endangered or threatened? I'm sure you could guess that last part. How much can they get up to in weight? Like how much can they weigh? Which it's pretty amazing what that number is. Classification. I want you to take me through domain through species. Um, tell me how they're classified. How long can they live? And what are their current threats? What are their greatest threats? Their numbers are, of course, extremely low. And so we do want to protect them and try to allow them to rebound from a biological perspective and so it's very important so try to answer you know answer these questions for me this is part one of four of the questions so we're going to be talking today about food webs and food chains and so food webs you can see here are a lot more complicated than food chains food chains is just a straight line food webs are basically a lot of food chains combined these are both models models help scientists understand the world around us they use food webs and food chains a lot when they're investigating ecosystems when the bp oil rig explode they did many studies about how that affected various food webs and food chains uh, along the marshes and various places. And so food webs and food chains are very important to understand the basics of. You can see that either one, though, you have to get energy from the sun. So you, have, you start with producers, then you go up to consumers, and secondary, tertiary, and then finally quaternary 
consumers. And so we're going to be talking a lot about food webs and food chains. Before that, we're going to, uh, well, after that, I should say, producers versus consumers. And one of my first years teaching at the school, I mean, I've been teaching for about nine years. Um, they, uh, I had asked a question, I was teaching this, and they gave a little quiz, and it wasn't a well-worded question, so, I, you know, I learned, you're always learning as a teacher how to do things more efficiently, how to help your students better. And so producers versus consumers, I asked this question to uh, middle school, seventh and eighth grade. Humans can make their own food. And so it wasn't well where what my goal was for them was to try to understand, you know, are we autotrophs or heterotrophs? But that it was a poor word question. I had a student come up and it was a fair question. And he comes up and he's like, uh, yeah, Mr. Harkula, um, does this mean we make our own sandwiches? And I cracked up because, you know, it's, it's a fair question, but it was just me being like, ah, oh, you know, it wasn't a well worded question at all. But of course we make our own sandwiches, but we don't make our own food inside of our bodies those are producers and we're not producers we're consumers and so primary producers are the first producers of energy rich compounds they are the foundation so organisms need energy we need energy for growth reproduction metabolic processes which keep us alive but of course we can't create energy energy cannot be created or destroyed so where does that energy come from it comes from the sun of course so the sun is straight up when we just celebrate easter so all these flower you know flower dresses my daughters wore beautiful flower dresses. And so, you know, flowers are amazing, very beautiful, but plants need sunlight to grow. But and we're in marine science, of course. So phytoplankton, of course, needs sunlight to grow. So autotrophs are also called primary producers. Autotrophs means self-nourishing in the Greek. They make their own food through the process, of course, known as photosynthesis. You've been learning about photosynthesis for, I'm sure, since like elementary school, right? Carbon dioxide plus water plus light energy, because you have to have that energy to make these complex carbohydrates and oxygen. Usually it's glucose in the examples. And so if you take one carbon, CO2, one carbon, and you're trying to make a molecule that has six carbons, C6, H12, O6, glucose, you have to input energy in. Ella Grace and I have watched a few episodes of Lego Masters. Um, we play with Legos a little bit. And you have to put energy in. If you're taking one Lego at a time, you have to put energy in to build that. It's, it's amazing what they build. But you have to put energy in. And where does that energy come from? It comes from the sun. So here's some marine examples. So there's your uh, phytoplankton. Example of one phytoplankton is dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates cause red tide. A certain, you know, certain species of them do. We were very familiar with red tide here in Florida. Uh, really hazardous to not only... The system, of course, kills all the, the fish and destroys kind of the shoreline, but people who have breathing problems, asthma, COPD, they, they really struggle a lot with red tide um, being around. Um, kelp, primary producer, but there's also primary producers that don't use light. These are hydrothermal vents. This is one of the greatest finds, according to scientists, in the biological realm in the 20th century. Finding these hydrothermal vents, because what they enable scientists to do was they enable scientists to understand that life can exist in these extreme places without sunlight, without much marine snow, those particles dripping down from the top being, you know, eaten particles. Life can still exist. Life makes a way. And so, how, you know, I think that's a quote from Jurassic Park. I'm not completely sure, but I think it is. Anyway, so here's part two of your questions about hydrothermal vents. How do hydrothermal vents supply nutrients to organisms. Where do they develop? So tell me where they develop. What kind of life would you expect to see? So give me some examples of the life that you would expect to see if you went down, you know, in a submarine or remote, you know, submarine um, and was watching on the video camera. What kind of life would you expect to see? And then considering how extreme the physical conditions are, we're talking about intense pressure, crazy and intense pressure. We're talking about crazy hot water down there. How, what are some adaptations? We talked about evolution already, you know, the last chapter. What are some adaptations that life has to enable them to exist and thrive in these situations? I'm going to give you so, uh, one answer right now. There's bacteria down there, and instead of using sunlight, like cyanobacteria would, this bacteria, uh, these bacteria use hydrogen sulfide, so chemosynthesis, so we're putting together, synthesizing with chemicals. And so the chemical is hydrogen sulfide. That allows the bacteria to have energy in order to build those sugars, those energy-rich compounds that are foundation of the food web. And so it's getting hot in Florida. It was, you know, been in the 90s a little bit. We're going to cool down in some days, but summer's coming. People will be eating watermelon before you know it. And I've seen some people go to town on watermelon. Um, my dad loves watermelon. I've never really been the hugest fan of watermelon. I mean, it's okay, but yeah, I've seen, you know, 
like a boss, right? And so, but we are consumers. Consumers can be an economic term, but consumers also is a biological term. We are heterotrophs, consumers. We have to eat something different than ourselves. Hetero means different, troph means nourishing. So something different, we have to eat something different. When consumers die, it, you know, there's also things that scavenge, sharks, crabs, lobsters, bacteria. And so what these scavengers do is they kind of break down material and enable it to return to the environment, release waste called detritus, and it sinks below the photic zone. So in marine systems, we have this top layer here, the photic zone. And then as you go deeper, you don't have life. So would there be phytoplankton down there? And the answer is no. So how do organisms get nutrients down there? Well, it's marine snow. So organisms are being eaten, scavenging, and various things up, up in the top level. And then that, those scraps fall down into the deeper levels. Bacteria and fungi are decomposers. So bacteria and marine systems return those nutrients back into the system, which is very important. We need to get those locked up nutrients back into the system to help life survive. So what's for dinner? That's what this lesson's all about. What's for dinner? I don't know if you ever asked your mom or your dad or your grandparents, your aunts or uncles, like, hey, what, what are we having tonight? You know, or where we want, where you want to go? You know, Chick-fil-A, Chipotle, um, going to splurge and go to macaroni grill, which has like the best bread ever that, you know, gain 20 pounds every time you eat it. But seriously, it's what's for dinner. So this is a picture of a food chain in the Everglades. So food chains are simpler models, but energy moves from the eaten to the eater. So you have algae producers, flagfish, largemouth bath, and hinga, or anhinga, I think it's anhinga, anhinga, and then alligator. So this is a food chain, but food chains illustrate that energy flows in a one-way direction. Energy is not recycled. Once energy is used, it's used. And so from primary to just various consumers, food chain shows those series of steps by, you know, what's for dinner, what's being eaten, and who's doing the eating. Food webs are more complex network. And so let me show you a picture here about that. You know, we already saw one food chain, but this is just a more complete food web in the Everglades. I don't know if you've ever been down to the Everglades. I haven't, but I hear it's pretty awesome and nice. Um, don't run into, of course, those you know, huge snakes down there. But you can see that the uh, producers are the foundation. You can kind of track them, right? And this was, the orange was the food chain that I showed you. But a couple of things were missing from that food chain model. We didn't show scavengers, like the vulture. Scavenger kind of eats whatever it can find. We didn't show the decomposers, which return nutrients back into the system. The tried as bacteria, associated fungi. You know, that's, that's important too to have those nutrients recycled back into the system. And so here's a picture from the book as a food web from marine systems. The sun is the foundation, and then you have phytoplankton right here. So phytoplankton, a lot of various zooplankton to eat them, pteropods, mycids. But you can see right here, there's our North Atlantic whale, right? Well, without the phytoplankton, what the North Atlantic right whale eats, the krill, <laughs> the thing about, you know, the Finding Nemo or movies, krill. Oh, look, there's lots of krill. But you know, without the krill, you know, without the phytoplankton, no mycids and no krill. And so, therefore, the North Atlantic right whale would have no food and it would move on to various other places. And so, you can see that the foundation was those phytoplankton. So, each step, kind of been seeing steps here. Every arrow is a step. Each step in a food chain or a food web is called a trophic level. So, here's a picture here. Every step we lose heat. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. Um, when you run an engine right, if you touch a hood, it's hot. That is, you know, uh, we can't create a perpetual motion machine because energy is always wasted in anything that we do. And so each step, I'm pretty sure only 10% of the energy goes to the next level. And so primary producers are your foundation, phytoplankton, seaweed, kelp. And then you have herbivorous consumers, which eat the primary producers. And then you have all these different levels of consumers. And so this is where the whole top of the food chain comes into play, that statement, top of the food chain. Because eventually, you're going to have a lot, you know, you're not going to have much energy way up here left. And so why do we see so many zooplankton and not as many dolphins? It's because there's not much energy left when you go through all these steps. And so, of course, everything is decomposed by decomposers bacteria and such, and that returns the nutrients back into the
the system. So here's questions three and four. If only 10% of the energy available is passed on, where does all the energy go? Actually, I already told you that. If 1 million calories are available to krill, so this is a little math here. How many are available to the small fish? Let me go back here. Krill would be right here. So small fish would be right there. Okay. So if 1 million are available to the krill, how many are available to the small fish? Just a little math there. And then do, do ecosystems generally contain more producers or consumers? Generally. Not always the case, but generally. So there's our Legos. Those are like the big ones for, meant for little ones like, you know, toddlers and stuff, but a handful of elements combined to form the building blocks of all known organisms. You and I are carbon-based organisms. Organisms cannot manufacture these elements and do not use them up, so where do they come from? Their availability is extremely important, and they, how do they affect ecosystems? So these nutrients and energy, chloroplasts, a producer converts light into organic compounds through, through photosynthesis. But not only do we need photosynthesis to make you know, these carbon-rich compounds, we also need chemicals necessary for metabolism, life processes, right? Enzy enzymatic reactions, um, all the reactions necessary for maintaining life at a cellular level. We need various nutrients. And so nutrients for an animal need to, these nutrients help the animal build tissues and carry out life processes, cellular activities. We need protein carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids. Those are the four macromolecules of life. Proteins, carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids. We need vitamins and minerals. I don't know if you take a multivitamin or not. Um, scientists are debating, you know, there's a debate sort of about like if vitamins are really that helpful for you. If you eat a healthy diet, usually the answer is like not too much, but if you don't eat a healthy diet, I'm sure it does help. Um, of course, this is a manufactured image, but when you eat, you have to break pizza. I haven't had pizza in so long. You have to break down the food into usable energy. By the cells. This is known as cellular respiration. I'm going to do another video about cellular respiration. You've heard about that before. But instead of pizza, what I'm really missing is Chipotle. I haven't had Chipotle in so long. I don't know if you like Chipotle, but it's it's glorious. All right. So here's questions four of four, and this is this is where we this is where we will end today. Let me see if I can speak English. Research the following organic compounds and tell me their role on a cellular level. So tell me what they do on a cellular. What do they allow the cell to do? Proteins. What are proteins used for? What are carbohydrates used for? What are lipids used for on a cellular level? Nucleic acids. This is DNA and RNA. That's that should already give you the hint right there. What what are those used for? Vitamins. I want you to give me three examples. What does vitamin A do? Or C? Or K? What does vitamin D do? We're all probably deficient in vitamin D, especially since we're locked inside. Um, get outside, please. Vitamin D, what does it do? Give me three examples and tell me what it does. And then also three minerals. Um, calcium, uh, phosphorus, zinc. What three, what are, give me three examples of minerals and what they do as well. Okay, so all those questions need to be emailed to me. I hope this video was helpful. Until next time, guys. Uh, I hope you're uh, getting the word. Enjoy your family. Enjoy your friends. Um, God bless. I'll talk to you later.